NFL Draft just days away, Thursday night on 97.3 ESPN. Let's get into it. John McMullen at JF McMullen on Twitter. Football at four. Use the hashtag football at four. And we get into it now on the Sports Bash show. It seems, John, that Yannick Ngakwe is not very happy with his current situation. Yeah, well, we've all known that, but he's amped it up uh, as the draft approaches. And he's basically calling out Tony Khan, who's uh, the son of Shad Khan, one of the owners of the Jaguars. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've seen this before. I mean, Stefan Diggs this offseason basically – uh, forced to trade out of Minnesota through social media. Uh, Yannick Ndakwe is trying to do the same thing. Um, to date, the Jaguars have been, you know, pretty consistent. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that he's not playing again for the Jaguars, but they have not uh, uh, started to lower the asking price. So that's the problem. I mean, they want a first-round pick, and it starts with that. And more on top of it, uh, and then, from a team's perspective, if you want to trade, if you want to trade for Yannick Ndakwe, you also got to pay him fifteen, sixteen million a year, somewhere in that range. Uh, so it makes it difficult. And as Tony Khan kind of tweeted back today, you know, he's not helping himself. He's not increasing his value by going on social media and basically trying to force uh, the hand of the Jaguars. The Jaguars would like to trade him, but. They're not going to give him away, so it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on. Very interesting, as, yeah, you mentioned Tony Khan said, yeah, I'm sure this isn't helping your value, uh, blasting the <laughs> owner on social media. I thought it was kind of interesting that the owner's son, now the owner's son is a little higher profile than just a normal coach's son. You know, he, he's you know he's got some sort of uh, title down there, um, and, he you know, he runs no, off. He, he's, he's, in essence, a, a, a co-owner of yeah. the team, uh, heavily involved. Um, and yeah, uh, he's not just you know, the the owner who's sitting at home. He he's a big part of that organization. Uh, he runs essentially the analytics side of the organization. He runs uh, his dad's soccer team. He runs the wrestling company. So uh, yeah, he's a big part uh, of that organization, and he's regarded as an owner of that team. So. Um, yeah, it's probably not helping uh, Yannick Ndakwe's value. And it's, you know, interesting from the Jaguars' part because, look, he's not going to play there. So at some point you would think you got to come off and, and, and maybe lower the value, lower what you want back. But it's it's a tough decision to make because, you know, 25-year-old edge rusher, I mean, that's, that's a valuable position in the NFL. You shouldn't have to – uh, lower your asking price, but we'll see. This is kind of uncharted territory in the fact that w how social media has affected the world of sports and, and athletes themselves can get their message out and say, look, I don't want to play here. I don't like it here. I don't like you. And as I said, you look at Stefan Diggs. He already accomplished his goal. What is um, – I, I mean, I know we always – uh, put these fantasy thoughts together. But Ngakwe's a guy that would be a great fit here. Uh, we know Roseman likes to do things. Is there some? Are there things that the Eagles have that matches up with Jacksonville that makes them a realistic candidate to make a call and make something work? Uh, only from the fact that the Eagles could use another edge rusher. Uh, but you have to – everything I just said, uh, you have to – throw into the equation, how much do you want to pay him? If you pay him, um, that type of money is obviously going to be a starter opposite Brandon Graham. What does that do to Derek Barnett? Uh, a lot of uh, machinations from that simply because the the GM of this team um, you know, doesn't want to give up on a first-round pick who has had some injury issues. But uh, I think people overstate that uh, when Derek Barnett's been out there, he's played pretty well. Uh, certainly at times. Uh, so I don't know if they want to do that. Um, I, I think the fit is just that it's a really good player. And maybe if the if the asking price does come down. But I, I will say now you have to start to ask yourself, because I, I know Tony personally. Tony is a very uh, 
good guy. Very Tony Khan, by the guy. way, right? Tony Khan yes. is who you're referring to, just to, so the yes. listeners know, know who you're talking about. Go ahead. Tony Khan, uh, you know, as far as owners in this league go, he's among the most accessible. Um, and other owners will look at that behavior and start to ask themselves, is this guy worth it? From that perspective, do you want to bring that kind of personality into the locker room? Because, uh, hey, we've seen it many times with players that have issues and, and players that are, for lack of a better word, troublemakers. You, you have to start at least asking that question, what the heck is going on that you're going on social media and attacking the owner of a team? I, I mean, that's a legitimate question at this point. Yeah, and you know, it's not everybody views everybody in the same manner. Just because eighty five percent might yeah. really like Tony Khan, he might have had a bad dealing with one guy. Of course, um, and, and so that's what you're kind of saying. This is a guy who's not typically like this, but obviously, Ngakwe has got to the point where he feels he's been mistreated. Yeah, and I'm just taking it as as an ownership perspective how they will look at it, right? And say to yourself. Uh, you're right. I mean, it doesn't matter how popular somebody is. Look, there's there's somebody out there who's not going to like it. I, I mean, that's just the way of the world. Uh, nobody likes everybody and vice versa. So it's not as much as that. It's, it's more of a, a professionalism thing. Uh, there's a certain way you're supposed to handle these types of things. Um, and obviously, they've been talking behind the scenes and Yannick says he was told that he's played his last game as a Jaguar. I, I take him at his word. I certainly think uh, that was probably expressed to him that they're probably going to try to move on. Um, but again, there are other ways to handle it than going on social media and putting people on blast. And, you know, with the draft coming up, perfect example of that is, you know, you have teams uh, – trying to teach young people that, look, the Internet's forever, social media's forever. If you tweet something out there or put it on Instagram that's uh, untoward, uh, whatever, uh, it's going to be up there and it's going to come back to haunt you. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand uh, that, to be honest, a lot of younger people. Um, and from a business standpoint, Look, you're you're an NFL player. You can't go online and <laughs> social media and blast the owner of your team. I mean, you just can't do that. You ever see somebody do that to Jeffrey Lurie? Uh, I don't. Did you imagine? That. No. Uh, well, I guess this comes from there was a report earlier today that multiple teams had tried to reach out to Jacksonville and that they had said the inclination that they got was that Yannick was not available. So maybe that kind of set him off. Well, perhaps, but I, I mean. Doesn't make it right. Look at Jalen Ramsey. You don't, you don't have to go back very far. The, the Jaguars, and specifically Shad Khan, said essentially the same thing about Jalen Ramsey <clears throat> right up until he got traded. I mean, that's sort of the back and forth, the normal back and forth of negotiating with other teams for valuable assets, you're going to say, ah, oh, we're not interested in trading them. Uh, but you keep the lines uh, open and you listen. Uh, and when they get to where you want them to get, you, you can make a move in that direction. Uh, and by no means am I trying to defend the Jacksonville Jaguars because in a lot of ways, I mean, that organization has turned into a joke. And I just said I like Tony Khan personally. But, you know, this team was, if you listen to Doug Peterson, they were basically an aggressive mindset away from Super Bowl, Super Bowl 52, in fact. Uh, and that's just over two calendar years ago. And now we're talking about that team as tanking for Trevor, you know, Trevor Lawrence in next year's draft. That's how bad – they're looking to be and projected to be uh, moving in the next season if we even have a next season. But so I think there's plenty of reasons to criticize the Jaguars, but I, I, I don't think it calls for unprofessionalism. And that's what that is with Yannick and Dockwe. That's unprofessionalism. And he might not think so, but that's hurting him in other teams' eyes as well. 
because an owner who, by the way, 99% of them aren't as open and engaging as Tony Khan, you think he's not going to take a a shot at you as an owner in this league? (laughs) Yeah, well, Khan, I think, uh, kind of on his way out the door, was like, I guess this isn't, isn't helping your uh, value right now. Gee, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it is. I think he's 100% right. So um, after this, does somebody have hand here in, to take a Seinfeld? I have hand, and you're going to need it. I mean, who's got the hand right now? Do the Jaguars and trying to trade him, or is Ngakwe now taking some of that power away from the team? Well, I certainly think uh, the Jaguars don't have as much hand as they did before when they were trying to play it off as we're not necessarily going to trade this guy. Uh, so from that standpoint, they've lost some leverage. The question is, has Ndokwe gained any leverage? Uh, I don't know if that's true either because, hey, they just might not trade him despite him. I mean, they're going to stink either way. They can stink with him sitting on the sidelines. They can stink without him. So maybe it becomes personal. And maybe it, it's lose-lose for everybody. And I think that's what Tony was trying to mm-hmm. uh, get across. Uh, it, I, I don't think it necessarily helps either side. Definitely doesn't help the Jaguars. Well, you know the game we like to play in Philly. The Jaguars also made news today by releasing wide receiver Marquise Lee. He signed a big deal. Four years, $38 million in 2018. He had been a pretty productive player for them, but I guess you know injuries last year. They only played six games. was not very productive, but 96 targets in 17, 105 targets in 16. Uh, we always, you know, anytime there's a receiver on the market, you, you, you look at the Eagles' point of view. Is Lee a guy teams will be lining up to get, or is he is the injury uh, problems too much here? Well, I, yeah, I don't think teams are going to be lining up, but he'll certainly have opportunities. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, probably one year prove it deal at this stage uh, of the game and free agency. But yeah, I mean, from the Eagles' perspective, um, they're going to see, you know, they've been very consistent uh, behind the scenes that they want a young receiver to grow with Carson Wentz. And they basically want a receiver who hasn't been exposed to other schemes, other organizations, other offenses, other players. They want a rookie. They want a clean slate. Now, it's possible they don't get it or, or they don't get the one that can be a difference maker early. And then you have to revisit that after the draft, after the first day, after the second day and say, all right, we didn't get what we wanted to get. And then you have to start visiting other avenues. So I think a lot of it depends on what happens in the draft. And if the Eagles are able to get a receiver that they're comfortable with, if they're not, then I think, Everybody on the street is back in the equation. All right, John. Uh, today they had the NFL mock draft, which apparently got off with a couple of glitches right at the start <laughs> of things. Uh, but then John Elway said on a conference call that everything else unfolded pretty smoothly the rest of the way. I don't know how they're getting this thing wrong. It doesn't seem to be rocket science here. I mean, worst case scenario. Everybody's it, forgetting to mute their lines. Oh Everybody my. forgets to mute their lines. Well, send a text yeah. to the commissioner. Here's our pick. How hard is that? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. I've said that from the start. I think this is much ado about nothing. Um, the CFL does it. The XFL did it. I, I, you should be able to do a, a virtual draft without a hiccup. Now, the difference, obviously, with the NFL is the tele- uh, uh attention and, and basically a microscope on it. But uh, as I said from the start, that's 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 an ESPN NFL Network ABC problem. They're televising it. That's their problem. Yeah. How to get that stuff situated? That's not the NFL's problem. So uh, as far as the TV aspect of it and the talking heads and getting the video ready and getting everything off seamlessly, again, the NFL has got to get out of that mindset and just say, do it, and those guys will figure it out. And if they have problems, they have problems. 
but the draft has to go on. Who are the Eagles taking the mock draft, you know? <laughs> well, the mock draft, <laughs> and by the way, people people got really upset about that. Well, what if guys tip their hands? They were doing everything alphabetically. So there was just it, it wasn't like you were saying, oh, I'm going to take – Joe Burrow, and then, then, no, they just put the names alphabetically, and they're just going through a run through. And, yeah, I and, thought they were know, doing like his, tipping their hands. I thought they were doing like historical picks, you know, like guys in your organization. Well, I don't know what the names were. They okay. might have been. Yeah. I, I, I'm saying, but the names were, you know, people weren't thinking about it. They were just handed names and 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 just right. run it off uh, for that exact reason. They're not going to ask teams to to use even more subterfuge than they usually do. Uh, it's just a run-through, and, and the names themselves weren't important. John McBowen, Football at Four here. A couple quickies uh, as we take a look at the draft, which is coming up, of course, Thursday night. Uh, Adam Schefter reporting the 49ers fielding calls on both their picks, 13 and 31, and are open to dealing either or both picks. I find the 49ers and 13 and 31 both to be interesting. Ten picks behind and eight picks ahead. It feels like Howie Roseman could see that and be like, now I can do something there. 13 gets me one of those receivers that I want, or 31 gets me out of that spot and possibly gets me some extra things. Is San Francisco a good match for Howie Roseman? Yeah, they are. It's the most natural, and I wrote about this on Sports Illustrated, and my one and only, 1.0 and only mock draft is also coming out. I have the Eagles trading up with the 49ers um, to get into that 31 spot. Um, the 49ers don't have – they they have 13 and 31. They don't have another pick until the fifth round. Uh, so they want to get back in business in the second day of the draft. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, both, as you said, both slots are interesting. 13 for if you want to go up and get C.D. Lamb. Now, he might not even be there because uh, the Raiders pick 12, and, and there's heavy speculation that he'll go there. But I do think if he starts to slip a little bit, then how he revisits that. Um, and then you have to talk about the other receivers. We talked about the top four if none of them are there at 21, what do you do at 21? Do you try to trade back? Um, it's going to be more difficult than people expect. Uh, so, you know, one equation I haven't seen a lot of people talk about is they take the pick at 21, even if the four receivers are gone. So if it's a linebacker, safety, what have you, and then you trade back up at 31 to get a receiver. Uh and that would be the Jalen Ragers or the Brandon Ayuk of the world. Yeah, you know, it, it sounds as if um, 13 and 31 are two very interesting spots. San Francisco, Philly, keep an eye on that. Another team uh, is Cleveland actively trying to trade down, but now it sounds like, you know, Cleveland's a tougher match because they're – almost too far up in the draft for you to – are they at number 10? So, you know, yeah. to get from 21 to 10 sounds like a whole heck of a lot of ammunition. Yeah, it, That puts it, you in the I Jerry Judy range, from, right? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, I, I think the Eagles would prefer Lamb either way. I think if they would go – they're going up to that level, uh, they would be going up to get Lamb. But, yeah, I mean, the, because – you know, if you look at the top ten, there's going to be a ton of tackles going. Uh, obviously, you have the quarterbacks, and two of being interesting, the sort of the linchpin. How many how many teams have crossed him off the board? So, if the Dolphins uh, eliminated him for medical purposes, and the Chargers did as well, that's one uh, spot you. That's one less spot the Eagles have. In other words. You know, the more quarterbacks taken, the more tackles taken, those receivers get pushed down the board a little bit. And that's when, if you're Howie Roseman, you start saying if they get a little bit close, just like last year what happened to Andre Dillard, nobody expected him to fall, then you start talking about going up. But, I, yeah, I think 10, a little bit too high. All right. Uh, John also covered the NBA for a long time. Did you – uh, cover the Jordan Bulls at all? 
Uh, no, not personally, but, you know, I lived through it, um, certainly, uh, just in general as a sports fan. I was NFL, then NBA, then back to the NFL. So I was doing pretty much the NFL during that whole run. But, um, yeah, I mean, very familiar with it. And that's one of the reasons I, I find it so interesting that, yeah, I, I do, you know, there was such hype over that uh, uh, first, obviously, show in the series. And, you know, I'm like, I wasn't as interested as most people because I already know <laughs> the story. I already well versed on the story. But if you put like a, a Will Chamberlain documentary, Bill Russell documentary, I'd be more interested in that to learn. So I do think it's it's good for younger people who don't know sort of legend or, or quite the legend of Michael Jordan. But when you live through it, you already know all that stuff. Well, as I tweeted today, which was the fact that what did I take from it is, is I guess under, I, it's amazing to me how competitive he was and how insignificant he is in his current role. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think people assume, you know, he, he was, and, and I do think, and that's what I, I tweeted back at you. I, I do think, not a lot, and I, I hesitate to say a lot, but look, there are plenty of NBA players who have had the athleticism of Michael Jordan. There, I, I mean, those are some of the best athletes of the world. So what differentiates him from those other guys, the Harold Miners of the world, who was once called Baby Jordan because of that athleticism, Jerry Stackhouse, people in Philadelphia – will remember him, just what a phenomenal athlete he was. What differentiates him from those guys? Right. And the, and the bottom line is you have that spectacular top-tier talent plus the competitiveness plus the work ethic. And that's why I said that's when you have special. But that doesn't mean he's going to be special at everything in his life. I'm sure he can't paint. Maybe he can. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm sure he's not an artist. doesn't mean he's going to be a a it, just, it just doesn't executive. seem that it bothers them that he's no good or that he, you know, like he's not out front. He's not very – I mean, he's like an invisible – like you would think a guy of this stature in basketball would be somebody that's propped up. You wouldn't even know he owns the team he's that terrible at this job. Well, you know, and, and a lot of – you know, it's more prevalent in coaching – and people always say, like, if you were a superstar in sports, generally you're not a very good coach. And I think that's uh, more understandable, more relatable to people, because if you're, you know, pick the name, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, whatever, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, whatever name you want to use, if you're that good, you, sometimes you can't relate to the average player. Right. And you can't, put, you know – sort of relate to them and, and and give them the information they need to be successful because everything uh, came so easily for you, for lack of a better term. It doesn't come easily because all those guys work so hard. But you get my point. It, it's hard for them to oh, relate yeah. to the average player. And, you know, but I, his competitiveness is legendary. His work ethic is legendary. And then you have the talent on top of it. And I think you see it in every sport. It's the same thing. When you have true, true superstars that have all three facets. And it's rare because usually if you're in high school or you're in college and you dominate because it's so easy for you, you tend to not have that work ethic. And you tend to not have that competitiveness. And that's the part that's missing for – a hundred players. That's the part, you know, we talk about Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. They're phenomenally talented. They don't have the other parts. They just don't. And that's the difference between guys like that and your average star in any sport. And you can say the same thing, superstars, Wayne Gretzky in hockey, uh, Tom Brady, everybody talks about Tom's competitiveness, his chip on his shoulder from being taken at 199. Tiger Woods, his work ethic is legendary. It, they all have that in common, every single one of them. 
John McMullen, follow him at JF McMullen, the uh, NFL draft. Three days from right now on the Sports Bash. We'll break it down throughout the week. Some more scenarios. Three days, three hours, 33 minutes, and 13 seconds. 3-3-3-3-3 across the board. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, Mike.